So for those attending um, remotely, this, this lecture has quite a lot of animation, so apologies that the, um, that the, um, uh, the PDF, which you'll see, won't actually uh, show you, it'd be particularly useful. But I do have... Um, I thought that um, I thought that you would get these in the live feed. I thought you'd get this kind of full screen. You're not, but I have a recording of this lecture. This is the only lecture which has significant animations in it. I have a recording of this lecture on YouTube, and I'll put the link up. Um, in fact, there is a link. There's a link to the final part of this lecture already on the materials page, and that points you to them. So this was a, a talk I gave a few years ago as part of a science festival. I think it was the British Science Festival. So it's slightly, you know, high level. Um, such like, uh, but it does, I think it covers all the major points of the course, so I thought it was a useful introduction to the course, um, to kind of the area we're going to be talking about, and we'll drill down into details over the next few lectures and over the next few weeks. So it's called Supercomputers in Science for the Big Bang to Climate Change. So again, I'll just run over what EPCC is, I've, I've already told you this, we're the Supercomputing Centre at the University of Edinburgh, there's a picture there making it look like it's very, very leafy and green where we are, but actually it's a bit more of an out-of-town um, campus. Um, scientists and engineers are always relegated to the outskirts of town, so we're, we're in the bottom right-hand corner of Edinburgh, just on what used to be the outskirts of town. Um, that's our building there. So the, uh, what I'm going to talk about is what a computer is used by. So this talk was really aimed at a very general audience, but you know, computers are ubiquitous nowadays because computing everywhere, and people use them for playing games, and they use them for playing games, and also updating their Facebook status, and watching videos. Occasionally people might browse the web, and uh, send email, and heaven forbid might do some work with them. But um, what I want to sort of show you here, hopefully kind of cover in, in this lecture, is that, that um, computers can actually be used, are used for scientific discovery. And that's for doing, so why this, this course is called computer simulation, is what I'm going to cover is the kind of hardware and, and programming techniques people use to program very big supercomputers, but also touching on the kind of algorithms and techniques that people use to simulate real-life systems and hopefully try and bring them together with some simple yeah. examples. Um, so, I mean, th the field which I'm going to talk about is called computational science. So that's not computer science. Computer science is, is, is the scientific investigation of computers and computing. Computational science is, is doing, doing science, as in physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, using computers. So there's a sort of a overloading of ter terminology. But what I mean by computational science is, is, is not the study of computers, but using computers to do scientific research. So um, here's a picture here of Peter Higgs, who's based at the University of Edinburgh and um, won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. And this is a reasonably good example. Back in the 60s, he came up with this theory, which was that there would be this, this, this Higgs boson responsible for the mass of, or, or the fundamental masses of, of particles around us. And um, what happened was, to try and find that, there's this enormous experiment built at uh, CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds spent. And I think, I think that is actually Peter standing there in the corner. You get a sense of the scale on these enormous experiments. And what would have been done classically, you know, sort of from when science, the modern um, view of science started around about when Newton started doing things, that you, you would come up with a theory, you would predict that something would fall, you know, an apple will fall from a tree, and you do an experiment, and if you get the right answer, you're happy. If you don't, you go back and refine the theory again, and you do the experiment. So there was this, this loop between the, the, two, the two pillars of, of sort of modern scientific discovery with theory and experiment. But that's not true anymore, because in this loop, in almost all areas of science, is computer simulation. So it, when, um, when they built the Large Hadron Collider, they didn't just build it, turn it on, and hope they find the Higgs boson. They'd already run sophisticated computer simulations, and this is a, a simulated event, finding a, a, a Higgs boson, was done decades before the machine was ever built. And so now, in, in almost all areas of science, there's, this, there's this, this circle of a theory. Then you have to do some computer simulation. You may or may not even be able to do the experiment, and then you go back and, do, and, and update your theory. But the important point is computer simulation, doing things on a computer, is, is, is intrinsic in this loop. And almost all areas increasingly in, in science are, are at some point in, in, the, in the research cycle and, or the development cycle, if you're doing engineering or, or commercial work, involves computer simulation. So the question is why? You know, why, was, why was Newton quite happy with his pencil and paper? And uh, nowadays we have to resort or, or use computing. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. 
first of all, the theories can just be too, too complicated to see some equations in fluid dynamics. You know, nowadays, um, it's very easy to write equations down. It's very difficult to solve them. So in a lot of areas, uh, it is simply, in most areas, it's simply not possible to solve a theory uh, just using pencil and paper. You can tackle it with a computer with numerical methods, but you can't do it analytically. It might be too expensive. If you're going to produce a new car, okay, it has to pass very um, stringent crash test um, uh, uh, experiments to make sure that the passengers will, will be safe if there's a crash. That's a very expensive experiment to do for two reasons. Obviously, you're going to waste two cars here, and if you get it wrong, you have to redesign your car. So what you want to do, maybe the experiment is too expensive to do, or you only want to do it once. You want to make sure that when your, when your robot lander lands on Mars, it gets it right, because you only get one shot. Or here you can have multiple shots, but it's, too, it's, it's very expensive. It might just be physically impossible to do the experiment. You might want to understand what's going on in the centre of a volcano to predict when the next volcanic eruptions are going to be. You can't send a probe into the centre of a volcano. If you simulate it on a computer, you can look right inside and see what's going on, but you can't do the physical experiment there. It may be too big. I mean, one of the big um, worries we have at the moment is about climate change. Um, almost all the evidence for climate change being... Um, being influenced by human activity comes from computer simulation. Okay, you know how you cannot do that experiment. You think, well, what if we double our CO2 emissions? What's going to happen in a hundred years' time? Well, the experiment's just too big to do. We can't tell. We can't create another world and, and tell you know one world not to not to, to to reduce their CO2 emissions, another world to turn them on. See what happens. The only way we can do these simulations because the experiment is too big or too possibly too uneth unethical to do, is to do it on a computer simulation. And, and the evidence for climate change being caused by human activity is almost entirely based on computer simulation. Okay? Everyone knows the world is getting hotter, you just stick a thermometer out. Is that caused by human activity? Well, that, that's a different question. And only by running computer simulations of the climate, running them from the 1700s and running a climate when, when there was no industrial revolution and seeing what happens, running another simulation where you, you, you put the input to the industrial revolution, can you actually tie the, the causality between human activity and, and climate change? It might be too small. You might want to look right in the centre of an atom or some, some very subatomic particle. You, you just can't do the experiment. It's only if you do it on a computer that you can do that. Or it might be too far away. You might want to, or the time scales are too long. What happens when two galaxies collide? I can look up in the night sky and find two galaxies that are colliding. I'm going to have to wait a billion years for them to collide. I need a computer to do the simulations to run it massively faster than real time to try and understand what's going on. So, I mean, a very, very simple example here, but it, it, it does illustrate a, a few interesting concepts. And I'm going to use this example in, in the future. It's what's the world's yearly income? So, I've gone and I found myself a list of all seven billion people in the world, in alphabetical order, amazingly. So at the top, there's a couple of brothers from Afghanistan, Adel and Amir, who unfortunately don't earn very much, they earn around a few hundred pounds each. And then we've gone further down the list, and there's, I'm, I'm there somewhere, my salary seems to be strangely obscure. So, and there I am, I'm at the position 5,303. Further down, there's some other figures you might, there's a woman called Elizabeth Windsor in the UK, who earned a couple of years ago 38 million pounds, she used to be quite well off. All the way down to the bottom of the list, the seven billionth person in the world, Zodjan Zuka Zinyama from Zimbabwe, who earn four, unfortunately, again, don't earn very much money, but they're, they're getting a bit more, three or four thousand pounds. So how am I going to add up, work out what the world's total income is? Well, I take my list of seven billion numbers, and I add it up and divide by seven billion. That seems quite obvious. So I'm going to write a computer program to do that, and I'm going to set some running total to zero. I'm going to start at the top of the list. I'm going to add the income to the total, the, and then I'm going to go, go to the next item in the list, and then I'm going to repeat if I'm not at the end of the list. And so I go back to the start again. So this is some pseudo program. But I think that just, just to look at that, the important point is in the loop, I have to do three things. Okay? I have to add my income to the total, I have to go to the next item in the list, and I have to check if I'm not at the end of the list and go back to the start. So I'm going to call that three operations. I'm being very naive here, but let's going to say that, 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 in a loop, which I have to do seven billion times, takes three operations. So the question is, how long does that take? Oh, and I'll print the total at the end. How long does that take? Well, I'm going to go through. So what I'm going to try to illustrate is, is, is the evolution of computing technology since the, since the early 70s, how processes have got faster, but also what the limits to that are. And that's going to motivate why parallel computing 
high performance computing has become um, much more important recently. So I'm going to go back in 1966, which might seem, seem a strange time to, to go back, but that's when I was born. So I'm a processor. I reckon I could, I could add one number a second. So I reckon I could do one operation a second. Sorry. So my frequency is one hertz, okay? What, one operation per second. Add the number, next second, I'm at the bottom of the list. Next second, go to the top of the list, okay? So my time per operation is one second. That means the time per loop is three seconds. I said that the loop had three operations. So if you work it out, it's going to take me 650 years to add that, that, by which time it will be a sadly out of date list, of course. Who knows what the number of people in the world will be in 650 years. But that gives you some ballpark. It tells you two things. A, people aren't very good at numerical calculations. But B, it does give you some feeling that that is really a very long time. So this is clearly what motivated computing in the early days. Mechanical calculations like this were just not doable by people. So back in 1971, what we might consider one of the first um, modern microprocessors was, was um, produced by Intel, the i4004, and it had a frequency of 100 kilohertz. So if you work that through, it had 100,000 operations per second. The time per operation was a millionth of a second. Time per loop is 30 microseconds, so that's two and a half days. So already, you know, over 40 years ago, we had um, early computer technology was able to take calculations which were simply impossible by pencil and paper and turn them into things which were, were tractable, even waiting a couple of days. But, you know, you can see that this is going to have a huge impact. Wind forward 20 years, the Pentium chip came out in the early 90s. It had a 60 megahertz frequency, that's 60 million operations a second. 17 nanoseconds per operation, that's more like 50 nanoseconds per loop, and we're down to six minutes. So um, these things are getting much faster. And then maybe wind forward to 2012, uh, there's an Intel chip called the Core i7, which had a three gigahertz frequency, and if you, if you wind that through, you're talking about only a nanosecond per loop, and that only takes seven seconds. So over, you know, 40 years, we've gone from something which took two and a half days to something which took seven seconds. And that looks great. That means that, you know, as time goes on, computing gets faster. So if I have a scientific program, I have a calculation I want to do, I just have to wait, and magically in a couple of years, somebody will come along with a faster processor, and my calculation will be faster. Now, unfortunately, that's not true anymore. I'm going to go through why. Just to get the figures straight, I mean, we get a bit blasé about these things nowadays. Oh, I've got a three gigahertz chip. Big deal. Um, in a third of a nanosecond, which is the time it takes a modern processor to do an instruction, light only goes 10 centimeters. Light goes, a f in old money, a foot a nanosecond. So in, in, in a third of a nanosecond, light, which is the fastest thing there is, only goes 10 centimeters. So you can see we're really down to quite phenomenal speeds here. But what I'm going to tell you is this is stopped. Okay, that's, that's quite an important point. So what I'm going to tell you is, so this is just a graphic, to how much faster? So in 1971, let's call me... Let's call the Intel 4W4 it, 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 its it speed. So this is the inverse of time. This is its speed was one. Okay, it was it was one. 1975, we were going about five times faster, ten times faster. 1980, a lot faster. 85, 1990. So you can see that you know, we'll come back to this, but performance is growing exponentially. So if I ran the calculations, if I ran that computer program I showed you. Start at the loop, add stuff, go back to it. I ran that. You can see that the, the times are getting exponentially faster. So let's wind forward a bit. I have to rescale things. And um, I'll make that 300 back down to the start. 1990 is now our baseline of 300. And we'll go forward again. 1995, faster again. 2000, faster. 2005, faster. And then what I'm going to tell you is that between 2005 and 2010, there was no improvement. If I'd run my program as I, I showed it to you in 2005, it would have gone 30,000 times faster than it did in 1971. If I ran the same program in 2010, it would have gone 30,000 fa fa 30, times faster. That seems counterintuitive because everyone knows between 2005 and 2010, computers got a lot more powerful, okay? And they continue to get more powerful. Yet I'm telling you the program that I wrote wouldn't have gone any faster, okay? So why is that? Well, if we look at what's happened, back in 1971, this chip had about 2,000 transistors, and you can actually see them. You can almost, you can almost see those tra individual transistors and tracks there. So a very simple processor. If we wind forward, and what happens is there's, there's, a, there's a, a law, an observation by Gordon Moore, who set up Intel Corporation, back, I think, in the mid-'60s. He noticed that manufacturing technology was increasing at such a... was, was, was developing 
so that you could put the twice on, 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 a, on a fixed size of silicon, a fixed chip, every roughly two years, you could put twice as many transistors on. And that, that, that increase in transistor density translates into an increase in frequency, which translates into faster processing. So that, 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 that's what's been driving this, you know, this, 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 this um, arms race in increasing gigahertz over the years, that, um, that, that, that the manufacturing technology enables you to build faster and faster processors. So we go wind forward to 1993, and we had 3 million transistors, and you can no longer see the individual, tra individual transistors. And then we go through down to 2004, about 2005, which is when I said that, um, that these things stopped happening. There's 100 million transistors. So, so between 1993 and 2004, we've now got you know, 30 times as many transistors. So we go to our computer engineer, our hardware designer, and say, you can have 30 times more transistors. So he designs a chip which is 30 times more complicated, you know, incredibly com complicated. And then in 2004, you say, there. in 2006, you come back and you say, I've got twice as many transistors. What are you going to do? And he comes up with this. So I'm not a hardware engineer, but you can see there's something suspicious going on there. He's just given me two of what I had before. Okay? He's just gone away, and rather than making a chip which is twice as complicated twice, he has just given me two of the processes he gave me before. Okay? And you may or may not like that, but that's what has caused... The, the, that stalling in the speed of, of that program that I wrote, in that this is a dual-core processor. All, since about the mid-2000s, rather than using transistor density, increasing transistor density, to produce faster processors, what they have done is they've given you processors which are the same speed, but they've given you more of them. Okay? So, what, so, so since 2005... Processors haven't got any faster. The, gig, the, the, the clock speeds are still in the few gigahertz. But what we do is we get more processors. And the reason is that by having the same frequency but twice of them, this produces less power and less heat. It's actually, you can't keep clocking up the, the gigahertz because eventually the power consumption gets too high and you, you couldn't use the machine, in a, uh, the, the, the processor in any normal device. You need special cooling. You couldn't use it in your laptop. If you went to 10 gigahertz processors, your laptop would get so hot it would burn your lap. No one's going to buy that, that kind of, uh, that kind of um, processor. Or if you have lots of them, then cooling them becomes, powering them becomes too, too costly, cooling them becomes too costly. So it's kind of physical limitations like heat dissipa dissipation have meant that since the mid-2000s, we have not had faster processors, we've got more of them. And that's why I showed my, um, my calculation stalling, because as written, that program could run on the left-hand core, and it could run on the right-hand core, but it can't run on both cores. That individual program will run at the same speed. Now, you may say, well, that's fine, I don't care, because I've got a laptop, I'm going to run that program on the left-hand core, I'm going to run a game on the right-hand core, or check my Facebook status. Or If you've got more than one thing to do, that's fine. Multi-core processors are great, because you've got more than one thing to do. They can all do different things at once. But if you've got a single calculation that you want to go fast, this is a problem. So what you need to do to take advantage of this is you need to parallelize that calculation. You need to take the single calculation and run it simultaneously on multiple cores. And so the two, the serial computing is, is, is old-fashioned computing like I had there. I just write a program and run it, and the limitation is, without some intervention, that will only run on one of the two cores at once, leaving the other one idle. Parallel computing, if you look up, well, if you look up the dictionary, I think this is the Oxford English Dictionary, Serial, as applied to computing, is of a processor running on a single task. So that's what I said. A normal program, I would call a serial program, it, it's a single task. It can only run on one of those cores. Parallel processing, in terms of computing, is a mode of operation in which a process is split into many parts which are executed simultaneously on different processors attached to the same computer. Well, we already have the second part. We already have different processors attached to the same computer, so we just need to do the first part. We need to split the operation into many parts. And it turns out that for something simple like addition, that, ter excuse me, that turns out to be a relatively simple process. The important point about addition is you can do it in parts. If, if I had to add up 100,000 numbers and I had 10 people to do it, I could just give 10,000 numbers to each person. They could all add up their sublist and I could add them together at the end because addition is an associative operation. And so it's actually quite simple in simple cases like that to take a program uh, and parallelize it, make it run simultaneously on multiple cores. So just in pseudocode, what I would do is I just write a program which I run simultaneously on both cores, but I say, well, if I'm core one, 
I sum the top half of the list, and I just run the same program I had before, but I restrict it from i equals 1 to n over 2, i equals 1 to 3.5 billion. And then, but if I'm core 2, I, I sum the bottom half of the list, so I, I run from uh, 3 billion and 3 and billion 500,000 and 1 to 7 billion, then having got those two totals, I'm going to add them together. But the important point is, to add them together, we both have to finish. And so the additional thing we need to do over and above running the serial program twice and arranging for the program to do different calculations is we need some synchronization, some communication between the cores. And in this simple example, it turns out just to be a wait. We need to wait for both cores to finish. It's only when both cores have finished that I can say that the, to the, the total is total one plus total two. And in this example, with, it, with big integers, I will get the same answer when I complete the process. So again, that may seem like a fairly trivial operation here. Well, it's fairly, I just wait for both cores to finish. But that does make you think, well, what happens if computing total one and total two took, took different times? Okay, I know in this example that adding the top half of the list and the top and bottom half of the list are, are, are operations of equivalent um, computational complexity. But if they weren't, what would I do here? And that's one of the challenges of, of parallel computing, is keeping all your processes busy all the time in situations, real situations, not synthetic ones like this, where you, you can't predict what the, ca uh, the calculation time. So we're moving forward. We now have, there's 4 billion transistors here. And again, if you count, there were 30 core, 32 cores there. Um, so so uh, that was a, a precursor, I think, of the, the Xeon Phi chip, the Intel Xeon Phi. So you, know, you can crank up more and more and more transistors. But all we can do with these extra transistors now, because of, as I said, practical considerations like heat and power, is to miniaturize the individual core, the, the individual processor, and get more of them. And nowadays, you can't buy a single core processor if you wanted one. Even your mobile phone is probably dual core or quad core. Um, so as I said, if we now wind forward, previously with my serial program, the, 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 um, the uh, performance stall at 30 times 30,000 times faster than the 1971 benchmark in 2005. But if I run that parallel program, I can, I can carry on riding Moore's law. I can take advantage of these extra transistors, and I can go four times faster in 2010, where I, at four, by 2010, I would have had a quad-core chip. I have four cores, and clearly, if I can split the calculation over two cores, it's fairly trivial to, to split it over four. But it is an important observation that, that, that computer uh, in individual computer programs, serial programs, are not getting any faster, despite the fact that, that, that computers are getting more powerful. And so what we do in supercomputing, well, we saw that if we took a, a, a dual-core processor and a parallel program, we got a faster program. But it's always true that, you know, it doesn't matter how fast one processor is, more than one is faster. And so the, the approach in parallel computing is to take many, many processors, okay? So this single processor already has multiple cores on it, multiple individual CPUs on it, but we can always do better than that. We can just buy lots of them and stick them together. And so as long as we can write a program which can take, tr take advantage of multiple processors, not just multiple cores on the same processor, but multiple distinct processors, um, then, then we, can, we, can, we can carry on, or we can, we can effectively exceed more, so we can just buy more and more processors. And this is the approach that supercomputing has taken for over 20 years, that rather than developing special purpose processors, you buy um, fairly standard processors because they're cheap, because they're mass produced, but you put lots of them together. So back um, until three or four years ago, we ran a system at ECCC called the Cray XE6, and it had about five, five and a half thousand CPUs, 90,000 cores. So you can see that each CPU there had, was a 16 core CPU, each with a gigabyte of memory. And it takes about a megawatt of power. So that ballpark, that's about a million pounds a year in electricity. So these are quite large installations, take a lot of power and cooling. Um, and, and I haven't really gone into the details, but those, in those processors, although the two cores on a single chip could easily communicate or see because they can read and write to the same memory, individual processors, which is like two laptops, okay? There's a couple of laptops in this room. Each might, ha might have a quad-core processor. To get those two laptops to speak to each other requires some external networking. In this case, it could be Wi-Fi or Ethernet. But for a parallel supercomputer, you, you buy a very fast network. So you buy lots and lots of fairly standard, relatively high-spec um, 
processors and you link them together with some dedicated network that allows you to communicate between the processors quickly and efficiently. The modern system is called Heck, uh, Archer. Uh, that's been around for a couple of years, I think late, late 2012. Um, again, this now has uh, 10,000 CPUs. Um, each CPU has 12 cores. So we have almost 12, um, 120,000 cores, a bit more memory, but still the same power consumption because this is the limiting factor now. The limiting factor in, in, in well, the limiting factor in computing is power, okay? In the sense, if you have a laptop, it can't run too hot, otherwise it would burn. If you have a, if you have a, a, um, a mobile phone, people don't like, people want their batteries to last a long time. So typically, what constrains you now is your power envelope. And if you're running a very large supercomputer, you know, you're limited by how much electricity you can afford, how much you can physically get into your computing center. So a megawatt, a couple of megawatts is kind of, kind of the, the, the envelope which we're operating in. But even within that fixed power budget, because of the increase in, um, uh, in both the number of, 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 of CPUs and the number of cores, um, that w w w it was carrying on uh, increasing performance. So this machine had about four has about four times the performance of its predecessor. And of course, you need a faster network to support that. We'll talk about this in the, in the next few weeks. So, I mean, I had a very, very simple example there of adding up numbers, which is a useful test case, but that's not what we really use these computers for. We use them, for example, for doing things like uh, uh, weather modeling. Okay, so, so when you turn on the news, uh, and, uh, and you find that it's going to rain in Edinburgh tomorrow, it's going to be sunny, it's going to be wet, it's going to be cold, whatever, that's a painting a rather bleak picture. Um, what's happened is that the UK Met Office run, they have their own currently um, Cray system, they run a computer program, a parallel computer program, to, 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 to simulate the weather, to work out what the weather is tomorrow, in faster than real time. Not, not, I mean, predicting the, not, no point predicting the weather tomorrow and it's taking two days two days to do it, so I need to do it faster than real time. And it turns out with weather forecasting, to a first approximation, what you do is you split the map up into sections. So basically, um, you, you, can, you can divide um, the map of uh, here, uh, the UK, uh, Great Britain and Ireland, into, into squares, and you can assign each square to a different processor. And the way the equations work, the communications between them is relatively, is localized in some sense. Um, we can come, we'll come back to these specific examples later. So that works reasonably well. It turns out that, you know, although the weather over the southeast of England may be slightly different from the weather, where the green processor is, is working, maybe slightly different from the weather over Edinburgh, where the red processor is, the calculation you do is effectively the same, okay? Stimulating the weather over whatever it is, 100 mile by 100 mile grid, is sort of about the same amount of work in each case. And so, um, it's a kind of naive explanation, but, but a lot of, of, of large-scale scientific computations um, can be split up um, into physical domains, different physical domains, and the physical domains can be operated on not completely independently. Clearly, the weather I is coupled between two, two of these squares, but it's coupled in a way that means that, um, th that you get more out of the... It, it, dividing the map up incurs additional communication, but you win because overall you have you can do parallel processing to increase the, the computation. I'll, I'll cover a much more simple example in detail, hopefully at the end of today. Another thing you might want to do is to simulate the planets. I'm old-fashioned, I still think Pluto is a planet um, around the sun. And you might say, okay, well, we'll take the same approach here. We'll just split the, the physical domain up into blocks. So I've got four processors. I'll split, uh, I'll just split the, the, the the void of space into four regions. But we have a problem here. It's twofold. Even as I've drawn it there, you can see the poor processor in the top right-hand corner has got five of the nine planets to do. So already there's this load balance issue. That weight statement I had in my very simple program is going to give us a problem here because the guy in the top right-hand corner is going to finish, going to take a long time to finish and the other guy is going to be waiting for him. So that's going to be a problem. Secondly, the planets move as well. So, you know, over time, that mi migrates the bottom left-hand processor. I can't, I can't say, well, um, I can't do something clever like, well, divide the, divide the void of space up in a slightly different way, shift the boundaries to make sure that everyone has, has the same number of planets because they move around. So different problems require different parallelization approaches. And here what you do is you don't divide up space, you divide up the, the, the entities you're simulating. So you would give a fixed number of planets to each processor. So if I had three processors, the blue, the red, and the green, 
I might give the inner planets to the red processor, the next three planets to the green processor, and the outer three planets to the blue processor. And that ensures load balance, that ensures that to first approximation, the, the, the processes have equal amounts of work to do, they're kept busy all the time. And so different problems have, can have different parallelization and parallelization approaches. And, 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 it, it's, and we'll, we'll look at a couple of these um, over the next few weeks. So, I mean, some sense, I think, of computers as being universal. And as, as a, for a scientist or an engineer, a computer is something like a universal experiment. We can build very complicated physical pieces of equipment to do experiments. We can build complicated microscopes. We can build the Hubble telescope. We can build um, the um, Curiosity rover, which had this amazing sky crane way of landing on Mars. All these things were amazing, um, amazing pieces of equipment. But they effectively built to do one thing. For a scientist or an engineer, a computer is like a universal experiment. It's like a blank sheet. Someone buys a computer and gives it to you. Um, but then, it just if, it, if you didn't program, it would just sit there. And so what computational scientists do, and increasing all scientists and engineers do, is, is they do, although the, um, the computer can be seen as a universal experiment, it can simulate the weather, it can simulate subatomic particles, it can simulate galactic collisions. You need to write software to do that. So increasingly, computational science is about has been for a long time about writing good software and that nowadays almost universally means good parallel software to take advantage of parallel processing um, to do particular simulations and so okay so i was going to so the, the last part of the talk was a bunch of um was a bunch of movies um i don't the movies are too big to cart around and that they tend to, to kill uh, machines like this so i'm not going to go through those but there is a there's a link on the web page to a YouTube video where I've gone through all those. Um, so that's, um, that's up there. So I'm going to stop that talk at that point. Um, so I just wonder if, I said that is very much sort of a high level um, uh, overview. I said written for a, um, for a public understanding lecture. I just wonder if there are, are there any questions on the, oops, I lost all my windows. Okay, I think most people are having, most people seem to be having, seem to be okay, I don't know why. Okay. Concern the machine will disappear into itself if I live cast the live cast. Oh my God, that's not quite right. So um, what I was gonna do now was I think probably just do a very brief, uh, I'll see how far I get through. So I want to break at three to give people a break. But um, uh, this lecture sort of overlaps the previous one, but I'll go through this, um, and that would be a good place to break um, because we started slightly, slightly late. So again, just briefly, high performance review, what it's used for and why. The previous talk has answered a lot of those, but I'll go through uh, a few of the other issues here. Um, I'll just give a few ideas for what the drivers for HPC are and, and some explanation of why. It, it's, I, I'm not a particularly a massive fan of hardware. I'm not a kind of a hardware junkie. Um, so if I get a laptop, I don't really care what it is as long as it's fast enough. However, parallel computing, you do need to understand the hardware, at least at conceptual level, to get the best out of it. So the hardware, uh, maybe in a few decades' time, we'll have compilers which can auto parallelize your software and you don't need to know anything about the hardware. We're not at that stage at the moment. Parallel computing is still a surprisingly uh, manual process and you need to understand two things. You need to understand how in principle you can decompose your problem in, in parallel, split your, your program or your, your task up into subtasks, but you also need to understand how the hardware works to be able to allocate them effectively to, to different processes, different, different, different computing units. Um, okay. So what's HPC used for? Well, we've seen, just to recap, scientific simulation and, and modeling drive the need for greater computing. But I've talked a lot about scientific simulation. A lot of my examples were, were from science. But of course, this is equally true in, in, um, in engineering, you know, designing any, any, any physical device, cars, in designing computers themselves requires vast amounts of computer simulation. And we've seen that making processes with faster clock speeds is difficult. We have heat and power limitations. I mean, you could go out and ask a computer manufacturer to make you a very fast processor uh, and say, look, I'll, 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 buy, I'll put in special cooling equipment. It's fine. I'll, I'll cool it. I don't care. 
But the problem is that, that chip development is incredibly expensive. It costs billions of pounds to develop a new processor technology. And you might think that Archer has a lot of cores in it, has 120,000 cores. That's nothing compared to the... I mean, there's 10 times that much computing in Edinburgh alone on people's you know, laptops and desktops. The high-performance computing market, although the individual computers are very big, taken globally, it's a minuscule fraction of, 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 of the IT sector. So all the investment goes into commodity technology. So although you could go out and get someone to build your special purpose processor, it's simply not economically viable. The most efficient, well-built, um, performant processors in the world, the leading edge ones, are the ones that you have in everyday devices because it's a multi-billion dollar market as opposed to a more of a, a niche market that we kind of inhabit. Um, and actually you may have seen also that Archer has a large amount of memory. It had um, uh, 300 gigabytes of memory, which is quite a lot of memory. And it's very difficult. You can't really put that amount of memory on a single processor. Largely, you use parallel computing to, to, to uh, access large amounts of computing power. But actually, it also gives you access to huge amounts of memory. Because um, we'll see that the amount of memory effectively scales with the number of processors. By adding more processors, you add more memory. And, um, and, and that can be useful as well. So a generic parallel machine, um, the best conceptual model I have for a parallel machine is that um, a lot is a lot of laptops connected together by a network. So modern parallel computers are um, lots of individual small computers, which I think are maybe like a laptop with a few tens of cores linked together by some network. And each of these, um, uh, now of course, um, in a machine like Archer, the laptops don't have, the, the individual computers don't have keyboards or screens. The network is very high performance. Conceptually, that's what they're built on. And each of these laptops, each individual computer, runs its own operating system. So you have a very, very large, it's effectively a, a very souped up cluster. You have a very large number of thousands of individual computers, each being multi-core, each running their own operating system, linked by some network. And it's up to the programmer, the parallel programmer, to, to, to divide their problem up and, and distribute it across these, these distributed resources. So. Typically, the, the, the terminology we use is each laptop will be called a compute node. So um, I would, um, you know, you talk about how many nodes a parallel computer has. Um, so by a node, a node will be one operating system, but also it will have um, one connection to the network. So if we think of the net, the, commu the communications network as being a graph, we can think of the the endpoints, the nodes of the graph, being the the, being the, the, the computers that, that talk down them. Each has its own operating system and its own uh, network connection. So, for example, um, um, on Archer, we'll be running, um, I'm going to get this number wrong, about 5,000 copies of Linux, for example. 5,000 individual Linux systems talking to each other. And so if this system, e if each of these was a quad-core laptop, then we would say the total system had 20 cores. But it actually, we kind of need to know that although the machine has 20 cores, it's actually five individual nodes, five individual computers, uh, each of which is a quad-core system. So, so modern parallel computers have this hierarchy, this parallelism within a node, within a computer, because of multi-core technology, but then we buy lots of them and string them together. And so the kinds of simulations you run, again, it, um, there's, a, there's a nice one there of um, someone was simulating um, dinosaurs running on the, on the um, on, on Archer. Um, and I said that the video that I've, I've not gone through the final part of the, of the previous talk, the video on the, on the web goes through a lot of these examples and explains kind of how they work. Um, the fundamentals, as I said before, parallel computing, high performance computing, internet related. Again, 25, 30 years ago, you could do high performance computing by going out and buying a special processor, which is really fast. But for the last well over 20 years, to get high performance, you need to, to go to parallel programming. And there are, there are at least two, but there are two fairly, um, there are two very different programming models you can use to program in parallel. One relies on shared memory and one relies on distributed memory. I'll talk about these. And you do need to understand how they work to get the, both, the, be the best out of your hardware. Um, so uh, again, why do you need to know? Well, there's a whole bunch of, there's, there's lots of different parallel computers that are out there. It allows you to use the appropriate resource for your application. You have a problem you want to solve. You've got a way of parallelizing it. You've maybe written your software. Then you've got a whole plethora of different computers to run on. What kind of computer do you want? Do you want one with 
a lot of nodes each of which with a small number of cores on them. Do you want to have a small number of nodes each with a large number of cores on them? Do you want a machine with some more some some accelerators, something with GPUs attached with some more modern accelerator, some, some, some alternative accelerator like a Xeon Phi? These decisions, you know, if you understand how the hardware works, you can you can you can make an informed decision about what the best resource to run on. Um, again, understanding the way that com that parallel computers work can inform you on how best to parallelize your application. There's always more than one way to parallelize an application, but if you understand how, how parallel computing works, you can realize that one isn't going to be particularly efficient and one might be efficient. Um, differences from desktop computing, um, you don't log on to the compute nodes of a parallel computer directly. So we'll see that when you do the exercises, you submit the jobs via some batch scheduling system. So you log on, I have a diagram in a second, but you log on to some gateway or login node um, and then from there you submit jobs to the, to the cluster, to the parallel computer. It's not a GUI-based environment. It's, um, for someone like me, it's kind of well, well, old-fashioned in a good way. It's um, almost universally Linux-based and, 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 and fairly command-line-based. Um, um, I mean, there are, there are more GUI-type GUI environments coming in, but it's not really... Um, it is, it's fairly old-fashioned uh, command-line um, stuff. You share the system with many users. I mean, a, a machine like Archer has um, 120,000 cores. We have thousands of users. Any one time, hundreds of users will be on running jobs on the system. That's how it works. And the resources are very tightly monitored and controlled. So, for example, if you want to use Archer uh, uh, large scale, you would make an application. You would get, you would get an allocation of, of computing time, which is effectively a budget certain amount of computing hours, CPU hours, and every time you run a job, it will be decremented against that. When you run out of CPU hours, you can't run anymore. So they, it's not a free-for-all like sort of, you know, a sort of departmental server might be. They tend to be much more locked down and tightly controlled, both in terms of CPU usage and, and disk usage. They're very tightly controlled. We only have a certain amount of disk. We only have a certain number of processors, and they're, and they're, they're allocated. So I, I've talked about performance a lot, actually. Um, I should quantify what I mean by that. And for sort of scientific and technical computing um, engineering, we use floating point operations per second flops. So a floating point operation per second is adding two double precision numbers. I mean, com modern computing is almost universally done in double precision rather than single nowadays. Um, I'll cover some of these issues in a couple of weeks, how, these, how you actually do floating point arithmetic on a, on a computer. But um, adding two double precision numbers together, multiplying two double precision numbers, Decision numbers together. A modern processor can issue um, one of these instructions per cycle. There'll be a single assembly language machine code instruction for multiplying, and it seems incredible, the single assembly language instruction for multiplying two double precision floating point numbers together. But this is called a floating point operation, one floating point operation. And um, modern computers are, are measured in the kind of petaflops um, uh, performance. So killer kilo is 1,000, mega is a million, giga, tera, peta, exa. We're at the peta scale, 10 to the 12 floating point operations per second. So, so Archer has a peak performance of around about 2.5 petaflops, uh, 2.5 million million floating point operations per second. Now, we'll see that that is something akin to the, um, to the uh, um, environmental rating of a Volkswagen, what you get when you actually drive it is very different from what it might say on the tin, but um, th 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 there are other limiting factors um, to computing, and I'll, I'll jump ahead. In, in practice, modern computing, and, and at least scientific and technical computing, is, is limited by access to memory. You might be able to do 10 to the 12 floating point operations per second, but you can't access 10 to the 12 um, floating point numbers per second. And memory, memory access speeds are lagging way, way, way behind clock speeds. It's a major, major issue that basically that is all that matters in modern scientific and technical computing is, is memory bandwidth. Um, the, 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 um, the clock rates are effectively semi and really not your limiting factor. That's for scientific and technical computing. Other disciplines have their own measures. If you're doing, if you're in graphics, you want frames per second. Doing gra um, if you were doing, um, uh, uh, if you're working for a bank, you would want to database access per second. So other disciplines have their own measures, but in scientific computation, floating point operations per second is is kind of the benchmark, the metric that's used uh, for good or ill. So very briefly, a schematic of how, how we how we use an HPC system, and you'll 
you'll encounter this whether you use Arch or, or, or if you're a, a local user, you use Eddy in the university cluster. You, from externally, you SSH into some login nodes to upload and download data, compile, and then to it, so the login nodes will be a, a few front end systems, but the, but the hundreds, thousands of cores um, which you actually want to run your parallel program on, which is typically called the compute nodes, you don't log on to them directly. You have an intermediary batch system, so you just say, you know, could you please run this job? It's going to take an hour and I want 100 cores. And, and, and the batch system is, is the thing which, which schedules those onto the compute nodes. And the communication, there will be shared disk between the two. So, so I.O. can be, you, you know, your program can easily be uploaded and, and data can be retrieved through some shared disk system. But it is important to note that you're logging onto some front-end system and interacting at least sort of um, second-hand access through this batch system. And in fact, the batch system is about the only thing which has a global view of the computer. Each of the compute nodes is just a little Linux machine sitting there running Linux, thinking that, that it's a nice little 12-core machine. It's not really aware of the fact it's in a big cluster and it has some network access. Each of these are individual, individual computers. The only global view you have of the machine is the batch system. That's the only piece of software which only has a global view of the whole machine as a whole. Um, and then, typically, as I said, you write code and compile on the login nodes. Uh, and then you execute on the on the compute nodes, and um, and go around in some cycles. And Archer, just to reiterate, it's we've seen this picture already, but um, I've mentioned it has a two and a half uh, petaflop, two point five times ten to the twelve floating point operations per second in, in principle. Um, the machine's got a free XT thirty. It has Intel Ivy Bridge processors. Typically 24 cores per node, so that's where you have about 5,000 nodes and 120,000 cores and 4,920 nodes, each running a version of Linux called Compute Node Linux. So you might say, well, wait a second, I haven't told you, but Archer costs about 43 million pounds. So you've, bought, you've, you've given 43 million pounds to Cray, and they've given you processors from Intel, and they give you some operating system they found free on the web called Linux. That doesn't seem like a very good deal. Well, what makes a parallel computer special is the interconnect. And what Cray have put their effort into is, to, to, is, is creating very, very high performance, high bandwidth and low latency um, networks. And on Archer, we have something called the Ares Interconnect. has a strange topology. They've called the Dragonfly topology. But the main point is that, that is Cray's input, at least at the hardware level. They also do the full software stack. But at the hardware level, the thing which makes Archer unique from a bunch of Linux laptops is, is, is the Interconnect. And has a bunch of software that, that it runs. So summary, as I said, high performance computing is, is equal to parallel computing and has been for over 20 years. You have to run on multiple process cores at the same time, and it may seem strange, but that's still very much, a, in most real applications, is very much a manual um, developer-driven process. Um, we typically use fairly standard processors because that's where the mass market is, that's where the billions of dollars of investment goes in. We buy standard processors, but we use thousands of them. And the one additional feature you need to make this work is a very fast interconnect, a very fast network for interprocessor communication. Okay, so that was the um, the talk. I'm sort of almost back on time. I'll just check if there's any questions on the. Um, no. So, does anyone have any any questions at all about any of that? So, it's fairly general, high level. I'll go into a bit more detail in the next talk, but. So what I'll cover in the next talk is I'll, I'll just give a brief overview of the hardware and then I will um, cover um, the two exercises which, um, which um, I'm going to hope people are going to work on. Uh, one is designed, one is a pre-packaged parallel program that's purely designed to make sure that between now and next week you can get on and utilize parallel computing. You won't really, if you haven't done parallel computing before, I don't expect you to understand how it works, but I want to make sure that you run a parallel program early just to get the, all the, the issues flushed out of your use of Eddy or Archer, depending on whether you're a local or remote user. The other program is um, going to be a simple cellular automaton model, which is uh, relatively uh, straightforward to program, um, but the point of programming is that that's a model we'll look at next week and say, okay, you've written this very simple model uh, in, in serial, you've written a program in whatever language you want, Python, C, C++, Java, whatever you want. Um, how would we parallelize this? And it's a surprisingly, it's a very simple example, but it's a surprisingly good model for how real scientific computation is parallelized and illustrates, I'll use it to illustrate the two basic um, distributed and shared memory programming models.
So I'll stop there and we'll come back at, uh, get back on time at half three and I should be finished at half four, so we've caught up some time. Thank you. So I'm, um, I'll start again. Apologies to those viewing remotely that will, um, it looks like we still don't have a, a, a separate PowerPoint feed. You the slides are on the web, so the next, the talk I'm going to give now is, um, Uh, the fourth talk, HPC architectures, um, I I under the lecture slide materials. So, so I'm going to give a brief um, overview of, of, of the kind of uh, HPC architectures which which are around at the moment, and, and to sort of allude to how they how they how, how we program them. And I'll, I'll go into detail uh, next week. So I'll talk about shared memory architectures, distributed memory architectures, hybrid distributed memory, shared memory architectures, and a bit about accelerators, which is um, GPUs and such like. And then a bit of an overview as to how these machines are classified. So the first thing is shared memory architectures. This is, this is nowadays synonymous with multi-core architectures. So a shared memory architecture is a uh, 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 an architecture where you have uh, multiple processors or processor cores attached to the same memory. And that's the architecture your laptop or your desktop will have. You'll have a single block of memory with multiple processors or processor cores attached to it. Now, in fact, multiprocessor systems have been around for a long time, since the early 90s. But what used to happen is manufacturers produced single core processors. So you went to the hardware store and you bought a processor. You got a processor. And if you wanted to have a multi, uh, sorry, if you wanted to have a shared memory architecture, you had to build a special motherboard where you plugged lots of single core processors in and had external wiring to connect them to the same memory. Okay, so shared memory architectures have been around for a long, long time, and we tend to call that multi-socket system. So you look at a motherboard that have, have multiple sockets. You stick processors in each socket, and there's external wiring to, to attach that to the memory. Um, nowadays, modern multi-core processors are just a packaging technology. You get a shared memory systems on a single chip. Okay, so you can't even buy a multi-core processor if you want one. But the idea of of of, of so so, <laughs> it's a slightly confusing system uh, 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 situation uh, because the word processor has ceased to really mean anything. To me, as more of a software person, a processor is a core. It's a CPU. It's something which can issue an instruction and multiply two numbers together. To a hardware person, the processor is the thing you buy off the shelf, and it might have lots of cores on it. Okay, So a processor is kind of a meaningless term now, or an ambiguous term. So probably the correct terminology is core, for, the, for, for the, what I would call a single CPU. And socket is typically what we talk about. A multi-socket system would be something which have, have had a couple of processors in it where the sort of wiring is external. But the important point is a single operating system controls the entire shared memory system. Your laptop only runs one copy of the Mac OS, one copy of Linux, okay? So all those cores, however they're connected together, they're all attached to the same block of memory and they're all under the control of the same operating system. So that's really what a node is. In, in, in a parallel supercomputer, a node is what I would sort of call a computer, but it means a, a single system with a single operating system. It's really the OS which defines um, that sort of domain. So this is conceptually what it looks like. Um, we have a single block of memory, a lot of processors or cores attached to it, and they'll be attached through some shared bus. So there'll be some circuitry to allow all the processors to access the same shared memory. And in this situation, all cores have the same access to memory. So they're all, they're all equivalent in terms of their access to memory. But you can immediately see, and so that's what a multi-core laptop is like. You have a bunch of processor cores all attached to some block of memory. And you can immediately see there's a problem because there's a bottleneck. There's only one link going into the memory and multiple processors. And you can see immediately, I already said that memory access speeds were, were, were a major limiting factor. Well, this is even worse. You're, at, you're attaching multiple, multiple cores to the same same memory and there's a single bottleneck so this doesn't scale particularly well and typically you know a f 10 or so a, a four to 10 16 cores attached to the same block of memory in, the, in, the, in this architecture is kind of kind of the limit of, of practical practical usability but this this is what your what your um, um, 
your, your laptop looks like. And you may worry, you might say, well, wait a second, surely lots of processors writing to the same block of memory is going to be dangerous. They could overwrite each other. Well, yes, in principle they can. For, for, for normal programming, so, so if you write lots of individual applications, each of them to become an operating system process, and they're isolated from each other. But we'll see that to do parallel programming, we use threads, and there they can access the same physical memory. And these issues of, of, of race conditions, of, of multiple threads reading and writing to the same memory location at the same time become things we have to, we have to think about. But these are called symmetric multiprocessing architectures. Multiprocessing because they have multiple processors, of course, but symmetric because they all have the same access speed to memory. They ha there's nobody, nobody is, um, is, is privileged. And actually sort of indicated on here on the processors, in these kind of architectures, you, modern processors have cache memory, which is very fast memory where they, where they, they store data for, for subsequent reuse. And the caches t will tend to be local to the processor. So although you have a single block of memory, to try and alleviate the fact that the, uh, the memory access speed is cripplingly slow, um, you have cache memory, and each processor will typically have its own cache. Um, what we do uh, to go beyond that is to build non-uniform memory access architectures. What this means is you build like a motherboard with four sockets. And as I said in the early days, if you wanted a four-processor system, a four-core system, you, you built a motherboard with four sockets and you stuck four single-core processors on it. Well, nowadays, what you could do is you could stick four quad-core processors on it. So each of the, the sockets takes a processor, which is a multi-core processor, which has here four cores and its own memory. But you have uh, some external wiring which allows all these cores to access any memory. So all the me although the memory is physically attached to a particular processor, there's a locality there. So, so in the top right-hand corner, this, th 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 these cores here, this processor, have faster access to that memory with a direct link than they do to this memory or this memory over some, 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 some external links. It's still a single operating system. So this would appear to the user as a 16-core system all governed by a single operating system. However, in terms of its performance characteristics, if you try hard enough, or not particularly hard, you can see that actually this is a non-uniform memory access architecture. Some memory is fast to access, which is the memory which is local to you. Some memory is slow. So conceptually, it's still a shared memory architecture. You still have a large block of memory and a lot of cores attached to it. But architecturally, it's implemented in a different way. And that, that leads to these non non uh, non-uniform memory access. So cores have faster access to their own local memory. And if you're concerned about performance, that can give you issues. Um, and we'll maybe, um, maybe be able to look at some of those issues later on. So most computers are now shared memory architectures, as I said, due to multi-core. Some are true shared memory with symmetric multiprocess, but most have some level of NUMA. Most computers now have, um, have multiple, uh, large, multi-processor uh, multi systems have multiple, multiple processors connected up externally, and so you get some, some non-uniform non memory access uh, element there. As a user, you, you program as if it's normal to symmetric multiprocessor. All the cores are controlled by a single OS, but I said it's implemented in a different way. However, this is, this is difficult to scale. Um, typically, I mean, day-to-day, uh, um, a, a, a multi-processor system might have a few tens of cores. Um, there, are sp there are dedicated manufacturers who try and scale these even larger. Silicon Graphics scale memories up to thousands, of, scale these systems up to thousands of cores. But it's very, very difficult to build shared memory systems with very large core counts. It, it tops out for two reasons. The first reason is, as I said, you have this bottleneck to memory, so although you can stick lots of cores on, some, some stage they become useless because they can't actually read or write data at any reasonable speed. But secondly, um, there's an issue here that, uh, I mean, you may not have time to go into this, but each of these, each of these processors has its own cache. Okay? You, have, you cache um, local, uh, local data. And if you only ever read data, that would be fine. The problem is people like to write data as well as read it. It's a bit of a problem. So whenever you update data, data in your cache, you need to tell all the other processors. You need to say, well, wait a second, I've just updated some memory. Um, so I've, I've updated my local copy of this data. If next time you access it, your, your ca your, if you have a cached copy, it's invalid. So when you read data, two processors can, can read the same data and both have their own cached copy of it, which is fine. 
that if one of them alters that data, it needs to tell all the other cores, hey, I've just changed the variable x. If you've got a copy of it, you're going to have to invalidate your cache and get it against the main memory. And clearly, that's very difficult to scale. Because every time I change data, I have to, have to tell tens, hundreds, thousands of other cores that I've changed that data. That eventually just runs out of steam. And that's really the, the limiting factor. This cache coherency problem is the, is the limiting factor to the size of these machines. So typically, a modern shared memory system will have a few tens of cores in it. But what we can always do is we can just buy lots of them. And this is distributed memory architectures where we build clusters. And so no matter what the, the, the building block is, what the most power efficient, cheapest, most effective multi-core uh, node is, we buy lots of them. And so multiple, effectively, uh, modern parallel computers like multiple, multiple computers, each running their own operating system, connected by some interconnect. And what that interconnect is will depend on whether you're building a, a small scale system, you might buy just a gigabit ethernet, or a moderate scale system, you might buy something more performant like InfiniBand, or a very large scale system like, like Arch, and you might have a, a bespoke interconnect. As I said, if I was in a, a training lab here with a lot of desktop machines that you're all sitting at, that would be the best conceptual model for a modern supercomputer. Lots of individual uh, computers, each, each multi-core, each running their own operating system, connected by some network. So each, each self-contained part is called a node. As I said before, each node runs its own copy of the OS. And so um, almost all HPC machines are distributed memory because of the fact that you cannot scale the shared memory architecture beyond tens, maybe hundreds of, of cores easily. And so that means that if you write a parallel program, you have to communicate over this interconnect. Different nodes, different operating systems have to communicate with each other. And the performance then is almost limited by, by the performance of the interconnect. So um, as I said, you can buy various, um, uh, various different uh, types of in, in interconnect. Um, it turns out that um, at some level, I mean, any program is only as fast as its slowest part. And so if you make the interconnect infinitely fast, then you might be CPU bound or memory bound or I.O. bound. But I mean, to, to a large extent, um, a lot of programs, are, to, to get to a very large scale, to run on many thousands of cores, you will need a very good interconnect. And that's why um, the very high end machines built like Cray and the IBM BlueGene series have their own dedicated, and it's, it's not a not a kind of project pro product you buy off the shelf. They have their own dedicated, sp specifically engineered um, uh, interconnect. In the mid-range, InfiniBand is the kind of dominant technology. One thing which may not be obvious, here, though, is that um, high bandwidth is relatively easy to achieve. Okay, it's like a motorway. If I want to expand the capacity of a motorway, I add an extra lane. If I want to uh, expand the bandwidth of an interconnect, I can just put two two wires in, three wires, four wires. Okay, bandwidth isn't particularly hard. Uh, to increase. The problem is latency. It's the, it's, it's the delay, the time taken to send a, a small message. That's the thing which is harder to achieve. And in fact, it turns out in, in high quantum computing, parallel computing, we tend to send a relatively large number of small messages, where the, 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 the time taken to, 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 to transmit the data is, is at least as much dominated by the latency as it is by the bandwidth. And the problem is, in the, in, in the commercial space, nobody really cares about latency. If you want to watch um, high-def TV at home, you want, you want large bandwidth. But if you're watching a second behind, you don't really care. If you're a gamer playing on a network, you will want to get some latency. But if, if the delay on a game is less than, I don't know, a, mi a, microse a millisecond, a thousandth of a second, you know, you're not going to be able to pick that up. If you're playing somebody, heaven forbid, shooting them in some arena, uh, virtually shooting them, I mean, and in some network game, a delay of a millisecond is just not going to be noticeable. But for high performance computing, a millisecond is a huge amount. A millisecond is a million operations. Uh, if, you're if you're operating at gigahertz frequencies, a millisecond is, 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 is many millions of, of wasted operations. And so what we want is low latency. And that's why, at least currently, these networks are, are bespoke. That the, the, although we're lucky we can ride the wave of very fast processors and cheap processors, in the commercial sector, for, for, for networks, low latency isn't something which, um, which is really targeted by commercial networks. So 
almost everything now forms into this class, distributed shared memory hybrids. So I said you, but you network together a lot of computers, a lot of nodes, where each one is a, is a, is a shared memory architecture. So we have multi-core nodes, each with their own memory, and that's why the memory in these large parallel systems scales with the number of nodes. Each node has its own memory, and you just bolt them together. Um, and so, and the network will have some topology. Um, for example, on the earlier, ver earlier incarnations of the Cray systems, it was quite a simple regular grid. The systems lived in a, a fairly simple 3D, 3D grid, um, communicated, routing up, down, left, right, forwards, backwards. The more modern networks are, are more, more complicated to give better bandwidth and better fault tolerance. But there is some topology um, in there. And so these, these hybrid architectures, um, not only multi-core nodes, but NUMA nodes, so multi, um, uh, multiple processors in a node, multiple multi-core processors connected by some external network. And so, as I said, it's very normal to have these NUMA non-uniform non memory access nodes, multi-socket systems and multi-core processors. But it's important to note that a single node is still one operating system. In this example, although each node is made up of four physical processors, each with four cores, it is still a single copy of your OS, in this case, normally Linux, ru running that, um, in charge of that entire, entire shared memory system. So, as I said, um, how do we program these? And this is what we'll talk about a bit tomorrow, uh, next week. But most applications in modern high-performance computing use something called message passing. So, basically, um, in order to get a, a s in order for two different nodes to communicate with each other, which remember are, are two effectively distinct computers connected by some network. They have to communicate data, and what we do is we, 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 we parallelize programs by message passing. When, when a, um, one processor wants to talk to another processor, it packages up the information and sends it down the wire. And in, in, to all intents and purposes, it's like writing a parallel program where your individual cores communicate with each other by sending and receiving emails. So, pretty good analogy. Whenever you, have to, whenever you want to exchange data with somebody, you have to explicitly package the data up into a single box and say, I want you to send this 45 kilobytes of data to processor number 53. It's sent over the network, and processor number 53 hopefully is issuing a receive to receive that data. It's a two-sided send and receive process. It's very manual. It's been around for 20, 25 years, but that's still the dominant way that, that, that these, um, these um, uh, systems are, pr are, are programmed. And the library which is used to do that is called MPI. So typically, we program using standard languages there have been a lot of parallel languages invented, but very few of them have ever taken off. People who are coming C, C, C++ or Fortran and call external library routines to do, um, to do this message passing. So the compiler isn't involved at all. The compiler just compiles your, your, your serial code and you have explicit calls to message passing uh, routines. We typically, the other difference about HPC is we typically run a single process per core. I mean, you might have a multi-core laptop with four cores, it's running hundreds of processors at any one time. If you look at Task Manager or Type Top in Linux or whatever the equivalent in the Mac is, you'll see it's running hundreds of processors, all being swapped in and out, time shared. For us, if you're only concerned about performance, there's no point running more processes than you have cores, okay? Because if you have eight processes and four cores, all that's gonna happen is they're gonna get time sliced. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna run in batches of four. So, so, so we tend, uh, for high performance computing, you tend not to use any of the sophisticated process scheduling or, or even virtual memory um, capabilities of modern operating systems. You want it, it's really quite stripped down. You really want to say, if I've got a quad core node, I want to run four processes, and I want, them, I want process one on core one, process two on core two, process three on core three, and process four on core four, okay? So modern operating systems are actually much too general. So, uh, so in a machine like, like Archer, the, the operating system that runs on the compute nodes is massively stripped down to get rid of all the extraneous functionality. In the old days, people used to write their own bespoke operating systems for high performance computing. They would, you know, a company would produce both the hardware and the software. But um, you can see the temptation. You can see how the conversation went. You know, you go to your Mac, your, your the product manager and say, yeah, yeah, we've got a team developing our own operating system. Or there's this one on the on the on the web that's free. 
What did you say? Free. Oh, that sounds really good. No, everyone on uses Linux. I mean, Linux has a lot of advantages, but it's not designed for high-performance computing. So a lot of what the customization which people do is actually taking a lot of stuff out to strip it right back. You might say this looks a bit weird because I'm saying that to obviously to communicate between two nodes, which are just physically distinct computers running different operating systems with some network, we're going to have to do something special, and, and this turns out to be sending messages. But on a node, in the shared memory, these, these cores can communicate by reading and writing, just reading and writing to the same memory. Uh, my, my analogy is a large, we'll cover this later, a large blackboard. Okay, uh, The cores are like four of you in an office, all sharing a big blackboard. You can read and write and, and communicate via writing to the blackboard. However, you can do that, and the way that um, shared memory programming is done which is typically done using multiple threads, is done through something called OpenMP. OpenMP is a way of um, a system um, which requires compiler support for, 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 for generating and managing multiple threads and programming in the shared memory environment. However, typically, typically um, people don't do that. Typically, people actually ignore the fact that you have this multiple level architecture and, and we'll see that you can write a message passing program where it seems wasteful that two cores on the same node communicate by sending messages to each other when they could in fact interact directly. But it doesn't harm you because in fact you're always, in fact you're limited by your slowest operation. And communication over the network is going to be the slow operation. So speeding up the communication within a node doesn't really help you because you still got to have to send messages over the interconnect. So it may seem unnatural, but until very recently people did tended not to take advantage of the fact that, that, that some of the cores were actually physically connected to the same memory. That is happening more, more where um, people are using a hybrid message passing and shared memory model where what you would typically do is in this system you'd run one process per uh, physical processor, one process per, per quad core processor, but then we get the cores within a single processor, within a single multi-core processor to communicate using threads. That's kind of, and then you get into lots of issues that modern operating systems try and isolate you from where processes and threads are physically running, but we want to have control over that. So again, that could be a, a customization which needs to be done. So just to sort of instantiate that with Archer, um, each node on Archer is a single 24 core system controlled by a single copy of Linux, but it's actually two 12-way multi-core processors per node. They're fairly standard. We said 3 gigahertz was the limit. They're sort of 2.73-ish gigahertz, fairly standard ivory bridge processors. And we have about 5,000 of them connected by this Aries network. So that's the kind of um, fairly typical of a, of a fairly high-end modern system. Many thousands of nodes, many thousands of copies of Linux, each node being um, this Numa architecture with multiple processors and a few tens of cores on each, on each node. Um, you might have heard that you know, accelerators are becoming more popular. People are trying to look at graphics processing. So there's a big drive. There's a drive to, to, to very efficient uh, processors for desktop and laptop computing. There's more of a drive to very efficient graphics processors because the games market is absolutely huge. And so um, there's an, order, an awful lot of effort gone into designing very fast, very performant uh, graphics processors designed for doing graphics. But people realized maybe five or ten years ago there was nothing to stop you using these processors for, for scientific and technical calculations. They're fundamentally doing floating point operations. Graphics is all about you know, geometry and, 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 and you know, rotations and such like these. These are the, 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 the floating point operations that graphics processors are optimized for. So people have started to use accelerated GPUs for doing non-graphical calculations. How are they incorporated? Well, um, typically you have a hybrid architecture. So you have a node. Uh, uh, well, for example, if we look at Archer, Archer has two 12-way multi-core processors per node. So each, if you were to look at a node of Archer, it would have two sockets and we'd have two processors stuck into them. If you wanted to inc in, in, in include an accelerator, you would, instead of having two processors per node, you'd have one processor, one 12-core processor, and one GPU, for example. So you have a hybrid architecture, a heterogeneous architecture, where a single node has a combination of, say, CPUs and GPUs. Um, 
So the nodes, it's just the same architecture. The nodes are, are connected using standard interconnect, but on a node, you might have a number of accelerators. And if, if you have two sockets, well, you can only have one, and you need to have some host processor and some, some socket. That, they're not particularly easy to program, although things are coming on at the moment, largely to communicate between accelerators, you have to basically communicate the data from the accelerator to the CPU. The CPU communicates over the network to another CPU, then the, 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 CP, then the, the data is translated to the GPU. So, so um, the, the, um, the GPUs are there to accelerate the performance of the CPU, um, but they, don't, they can't really communicate directly with each other, which introduces an extra hop. So, and also, communicating via CPU memory involves lots of extra copy operations. So um, the CPU and the GPU don't share memory. You have to physically copy between them, and that is a real, that's a real bottleneck at the moment in all accelerators, that you have a very, very fast, potentially very, very fast um, accelerated processor like a GPU, but its interface to the CPU is through some fairly sl relatively slow um, link, so you're limited by the co copying data between the two which is exacerbated by the fact that the GPUs are so, are so efficient, so, so, so good at doing floating point operations that, that, um, that, that, that they, they can in principle eat up data at a very fast rate. I mean, so what people talk, typically talk about in these machines is they talk about different tiers. And the kind of in Europe, we have, there's a sort of a classification. If you hear about someone taking a tier zero machine, a sort of pan-national facility. So there's a... a Foresight, uh, the Prace, Prace is a big project which is aimed at tying up supercomputing across across Europe at the very high level. What they, what they call tier zero machines, which are which are which are used by different nations. In this classification, Arch will be a tier one machine. It's a national facility. Then we have regional facilities. There are various regional organisations. They say in the UK to do that. And then tier three, you would have institutional facilities like like EDI. So so the two machines that we might be using for this course are tier one, which is the national facility Archer. And in this in this um, sense, in this classification, tier three, which are these uh, university level facilities like EDI, and where they differ is not so much in the processor technology, but more in the interconnect. And because of that, in the size, tier zero systems can have more nodes simply because they have a better interconnect, and therefore they can they can they can support more nodes. So a summary is, the vast majority of HPC machines are fairly simple architectures, really. Uh, well, fairly basic architectures. They're shared memory nodes linked by some interconnect. Um, we'll come back to this, but most are programmed using this pure me this message passing model. Um, we, we can talk about this uh, next time. And then the um, uh, the shared HPC, these machines span a wide variety of sizes, you know, from multi petaflops machines with millions of cores down to workstations with multiple CPUs and, and accelerators. And I would say, although I've been talking about um, the very high end, very large systems, the programming techniques we're going to be talking about, shared memory, distributed memory programming, are equally applicable to your laptop or a small cluster. It's just they become more, more important as, as, as the size goes up. So um, I'll just check if there's any questions. No, fine. So what I wanted to do, unless there are any questions, was just to go through briefly in the last 20 minutes, th the exercises. Um, the first one is this, um, again, this talk comes from another, um, this talk comes from another presentation. Again, another public understanding, but I think it's useful here. One of the exercises, there are two exercises. One is just to write a simple um, serial program in, as I said, any language you want, Python, Java, Fortran, C, whatever you want to, to do. Uh, to do traffic modeling. And the reason is that this traffic model, although very simple, is actually a very nice um, uh, analog of a real scientific computation which we could then think about how to parallelize. So very briefly, I'll go through this traffic modeling example. Um, yes. So we want to predict traffic flow. It's very useful to predict traffic flow. Uh, modeling traffic is a bit like simulating the weather. You have two modes. One is what you call weather forecasting. What's the weather going to be like tomorrow? What's the traffic going to be like in, at the rush hour? And then you can make local decisions like how are we going to alter the traffic lights? How are we going to you know, close lanes here and there? So people want um, 
like weather forecasting, short-term predictions of how, how, how traffic is going to evolve. Also, you want to, and you want to avoid congestion. Um, there's something slightly going funny with these. Yeah. Okay. These were originally videos. I think it's getting confused. It can't find the videos. Yeah. Okay. So you want to avoid congestion where things things lock up. But also the equivalent of of, of looking at climate forecasting is whether if, if you can predict the wet if you can predict traffic flow, you can say, okay, we're going to build a new bridge over the fourth. How is that going to alter the traffic flow? Where are we going to need new junctions? Where are we going to need new new road networks? That's longer term, you know, what if questions. You know, if we add an extra lane to this motorway, would it increase the throughput of traffic if we built a new junction here? So people use very sophisticated traffic models for, for, for longer term traffic planning, which is a bit more like, you know, long term climate change um, simulations. And so, um, so the controls have gone slightly sticky here. Yeah, we build computer models, and this is actually a computer model that was run at EPCC about 20, 25 years ago to, uh, to stimulate the new bridge roundabout to try and um, optimize the... And if you're not British, you may, you may not realize, but we love roundabouts, and we love, we love traffic lights, so we put traffic lights on roundabouts. Uh, so this was actually a simulation to optimize the, um, the, the uh, sequence of these traffic lights on this roundabout to try and maximize throughput, and also we were worried about pollution effects and that thing. But I'm gonna do a very, very simple model we're going to do the most simple model you can imagine. And um, you may have heard of the Game of Life, which is a, a simple 2D stellar automaton, um, Conway's Game of Life, which has been around for many years. Uh, well, this is even simpler. We're going to do a, a 1D stellar automaton. So we're just going to have, we're going to, we want to simulate traffic. We're going to divide the road into a series of cells. And I've got seven cells here. And cells are either occupied or unoccupied. So, and we have one rule, and the rule is, a car moves forward if it can and doesn't if it can't. So what would happen? So we perform a number of time steps, and each time step, which you could say is every second or whatever you want it to be, um, a car moves forward if it can and not if it can't. So in this situation, the first car can move, the second car can't, and the third car can. So they move like that. Then the second car and the third car can move. And then now we can see once you get this car gap, car gap, then they can all move and they're all happy. Off they move. Now, it's important to note, this is like an instantaneous update. You don't say, uh, you don't, you don't say uh, at this point here, uh, what's the, what am I saying? You don't say um, that, uh, you don't move that car, and then, this isn't actually going to illustrate that, but you don't, what I'm trying to say is that the, 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 the state of the road at the next time step is, is independent whether you update them left to right or right to left. What you say is that first car can move, that second car can't, and that third car can't, and then you move them, okay? So to move them instantaneously. You now say, oh, that first car can't move, that second car can, and that third car can't, and you move them instantaneously. Like that. And then off they go. So you see, the animation is a bit sticky here. And you could do this by moving pawns on a chess. Well, that's the analogy I'm going to use doing this uh, physically. In fact, a long time ago, me and my brother, before personal computers were invented, used to simulate the game of life on a, a go board with lots of half pence. Uh, half pence pieces don't even exist anymore. We used to, uh, if you haven't done the game of life, you have a large grid of cells which are um, become alive or dead, and we used to simulate that. But you could, you could imagine doing this traffic model on a chess board. You have a chess board with lots of squares and lots of pawns on it, and you model it like that. And what we're going to do is, is next week, we're going to think about how you would parallelize this calculation. But for the moment, I'm just going to um, uh, say that this traffic model predicts a number of interesting features. Traffic lights actually work reasonably well. So you can start off with some traffic lights. You've got four cars in a row. You've got a gap. And if the lights go green, you get realistic behavior, they don't move off in a block, you know, they congest at the traffic lights, then they move away um, in a reasonable, so that's reasonably realistic. And you can actually run this model and get congestion, um, so this is the exercises just to see if you can reproduce this graph. So clearly, so density of cars is the number of cars divided by the length of the road. So clearly at 100% density, every car is, every position is full, so the velocity is it. The velocity is the number of cars that move divided by the number of cars. So if the velocity is one, all the cars move. If the velocity is a half, half the cars have moved. So if we, 100% uh, uh, filling, clearly the velocity is zero. 
because the cars are, j are jammed and they can't move. At low density, at least asymptotically, when you run the model for it, they, they, they end up into this, this situation. Up to 50% filling, at some point, the cars end up arranging themselves car gap, car gap, car gap. So if you run the model for long enough, at some point, they're so, so at least asymptotically after a long time, up to 50% filling, the, 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 the speed is one. But then, above 50% filling, it's impossible for every car to move, and you get a rapid drop-off in, um, in velocity. So you get what looks, you know, you get a curve a bit like this. Below 50% filling, you, you expect velocity one, and then you get some, some quite rapid drop-off um, down to zero. And so it's, it's quite, it's, a, it's almost a trivial model, but it, it's, it's a useful computational exercise. And more importantly, it might be quite surprising, but this is actually a surprisingly good analog of quite large-scale parallel computation. And so um, we use more complicated models in practice, multiple lanes, different kinds of vehicles overtaking and such like. Um, I mean, I made this model up on my own because I thought, but it's actually, it's well known. I if you look on Wikipedia, it's called the, the 184 model because the update rule and so on. There are 256 possible 1D cellular automata and this is number 184. Um, look it up on Wikipedia. So how fast can we run the model? Well, again, this was a public, this, this, this lecture was originally written for a, the public understanding of science lecture, so I tried to put some fairly poor attempts of humour in. So the idea was we measured this in car operations per second, which were conveniently cops. So uh, we'll talk about how to do this in parallel later on, but I reckon that if you got somebody who's quite good at chess, this is Bobby Fischer, who was a fairly eccentric world chess master in the 70s, I reckon he could update this model at two car operations per second, I reckon. So I reckon we could do two car operations per second. And what we're going to do next week is we're going to see if we had three Bobby Fishers, could we update this model at three times? You see, could we update this model at six cops? Okay, And that's an interesting question. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. But for the moment, the exercise is just to, this is just a throwaway comment about the performance at the moment, uh, just to write the code in serial. This is a surprisingly useful model, though, because what we did is we took a real situation, which was real traffic, we came up with some, some, some way of simulating it. We came up with some, some update rules, and then we modeled that in, as a model it by hand, pawns on a chessboard, and we'll see next week how we can model that in parallel. So you have this loop from, from a real situation, you model it in some way, you have some update rules, you model it, and then you see how you can model it in parallel. That, that sort of loop is, is sort of analogous to, obviously much infinitely simpler, but analogous to how you might model uh, the weather. You have the real weather, and then you, um, you, you, you simulate that in terms of mathematical equations, and then you solve them using some numerical solution methods. We'll talk a bit about this on the fourth um, installment of this lecture. You then write a computer program to solve the, and then you write a parallel program. So this is, you know, although the steps are much simpler in the traffic model, you know, fundamentally, um, that they're, they're analogous, and more importantly, it might be surprising, but the communications pattern you need for something like um, parallel weather simulation is remarkably similar to the communications pattern you need for parallel, um, for parallel, the traffic model. So it, it, um, in, it's kind of obvious in the traffic model that the state of each cell depends on its two neighbors. The state of each cell at the new iteration depends on what's happening upstream and downstream. So you have a limited domain of, of interaction. Each cell, I, depends on its neighbors, I plus one and I minus one. Um, it might not be obvious, but it's true that, um, I'll maybe go back to, well, uh, no, I'll, 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 a bit, I don't have the slide ready to, um, um, but when we talked about um, dividing the map of the UK into squares to do a parallel simulation, it turns out the communications is typically just around the boundaries. Each, each, each square only needs to communicate with its, its nearest neighbours because it's only the boundary information. There's a limited um, domain of influence. The weather doesn't depend. The weather in the bottom in the southeast of, of Britain doesn't instantaneously depend on the weather in the, in, in the, in the, in the northwest of Scotland. There's some, 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 some locality to it, just as the same as the, the state of a cell only depends on its nearest neighbours, and that allows you to have relatively simple parallelization strategies. As I said, real com computers have 
sure there's a flops, not not cops. And and so, as I said, here it is. I did have I put the diagram on. So, what we're going to do in the parallel weather modeling, you would you would take the map of here. Um, uh, Great Britain, Northern Ireland, and, and the Republic of Ireland divide into squares, and you give a different square to each separate um, computer, each separate node of your or core on your parallel computer. But the important point is, and it's not obvious, but if you look at the equations, that each um, if every domain here had to communicate with every other domain, it wouldn't work. Every time you needed to update the model to the next time step, every core would have to communicate with every other core, and you would just be lost. You'd spend all your time communicating and no time calculating. However, it turns out that in these, at least in the simplest cases, um, the, the state of, of, of a cell only depends on its nearest neighbours, which translates into uh, a, a processor or a core only needing, needing to communicate with its nearest neighbours in 2D, possibly its eight nearest neighbours, the ones it's connected to. So the communication is localised, and so the communication overhead is, is, is manageably small. And you can actually, you, although there is an overhead to communication, um, it's it's it, it's 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 um, the, the increase in computational speed by parallelizing parallelizing your code uh, drowns out or outweighs the in the, the um, increased computation uh, increased communication. And again, the very simple traffic model, which we'll study next week, illustrates that. So the slide, if you look on the web, the um, the exercise material, I have an exercise sheet for the traffic modeling exercise. It goes on to talk about parallelization in sections three and four that are beyond the scope of today. But sections one and two are just a description of the model and um, the rules, quantify the rules, and then write a serial program and some hints as to how you could might play around with it to try and reproduce that, that, that um, graph of uh, average velocity against density. And I think it's a useful, reasonably interesting exercise, but the main reason for doing it is to you've written a serial program and then we can think, having written it, you've got a concrete idea of how it works. And then next week, we can think about how you might parallelize it using these two different parallelization models of shared and distributed memory. So that is just a, something you could do on your laptop. There's no, um, um, there's no parallelism there. The other example is um, called the Sharpen exercise. I have a very short lecture to introduce that. This is the example, which is, whoops, I don't want to do the PDF. I want to do the... the um, This is just a program I'm giving you, which you can you can run, but it's very useful because it allows you to check you can run on a parallel computer because it does two things. A, it's a parallel program, so you should be able to see it gets faster and faster when you run it on more cores. B, it does file I.O. It reads it an image and writes out an image, and that's important because um, at least on systems like Archer, you need to make sure you're running on the right file system, otherwise you get problems. So it checks those kind of basic things. So I'll just very briefly go through this. This is an example that I stole from the, uh, what would have then been the computer science department at, at, at Edinburgh. Um, it was done by, oh, so it's, I haven't even noticed it's Bob Fisher. I found this from something over 20, Hypermedia Image Processing Reference, Bob Fisher, Simon Perkins, Ashley Walker, at Wolfert from the Department of AI back in 94. That's why I found this example. But the, the reason for this is really to familiarize yourself with running parallel programs. So just to give you something concrete to do either on an Archer or an Eddy, to run a real parallel code that does file I.O. And you can measure the performance of this code and then we can see how well that correlates with something called Amdahl's law, which we'll cover later, which is a very simple model of how you'd expect um, um, sort of the, your zeroth order model of how you'd expect parallel performance to, to vary with, with core count. Obviously, you'd like if you run on 10 times as many cores, your program goes 10 times as fast. That's never the case. So Amdahl's law, this, this, this code illustrates in practice um, you can, do, you can measure the run times and we can come back to it and see how, how they do or don't uh, relate to what we'd expect. So to get you running on Archer already, to sort out all the details, to sort out your Windows, Mac, Linux, laptop, all those other bits and pieces. Uh, for those of you remotely, if you're trying to access Archer, um, Archer is actually down today for maintenance, but that's just a particular, I don't know if it's back at five or? Five is the intended return time. Um, but that's only every other Wednesday afternoon is an at-risk period. Um, it's, it's fairly rare that it goes down, um, but you'll definitely you'll have access beyond five o'clock today. There shouldn't be a problem. So, to introduce example, images can be fuzzy for a number of reasons. Two main reasons: random noise or blurring, 
or they could be fuzzy because they're a fake. There's a, there's a very famous 1930s picture of the Loch Ness Monster, which I always, even when I was a 10-year-old, I knew was a fake. Re recent, recently, the guy admitted he took it, that he faked it. Um, to me, it's obviously a fake. It's obviously the ripples about an inch high. But anyway, it was the most famous photo of the Loch Ness Monster for many decades. Um, random noise or blurring. So we can improve picture quality by two things. If noise is random, if you, if you av average things enough, you average to zero. So we can, sm we can smooth to remove noise. So we, we, we take a pixel and we average it with its nearest neighbours just to try and smooth out the noise. Okay? But secondly, if it's blurred, that doesn't help us. So what we need to do is enhance the edges. So, so we, if we've got random noise we've smoothed by averaging, and then to detect the edges, we can say there's an edge, and we can enhance the edges. We can detect the edges and, and multiply them up by some factor and then add them back in again. And so this is an example taken from that paper, and I don't know who this is, actually. This isn't Bob Fisher, so I don't know who it is. Fuzzy picture, you detect the edges, and then, as well as average, you, you add the edges back in with some increased, um, some increased factor, and you get a more sharp image. And that's what the program I'm going to give you does. Um, and just a bit of technical details, I mean, it doesn't really matter what they are, but the important point is you, each pixel is replaced by a weighted average of its neighbours, and you, you weight your nearby pixels with a, with a higher value. So, 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 so what we're going to do is we'll average over a 17 by 17 square. So each pixel is averaged with all the pixels plus or minus 8 from it. But we don't average, in, we want to average more highly with the close pixels. So we, are, we weight them with some Gaussian. So that's that, that I weight them with some Gaussian like that. Secondly, we want to detect the edges. And the standard way to do that is just to take the second derivative. So, you know... If, so if something is flat, it's not an edge. If it's increasing linearly, it's not an edge. Both of those have zero shape. But if it's, if it's curving up or curving down, that looks like an edge. So you, 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 just, ma you just take the second derivative of the image. Uh, this is called the grad squared Laplacian operator, but that doesn't really matter. Um, you're just effectively taking the second derivative of the, of the image to detect the edges. And you can do these both at once. It turns out to be a convolution opera operation. So it turns out if you average each pixel with its neighbours, but with this funny inverted top hat waiting, whoops, okay. Oh, you're not seeing anything. I'm seeing something funny here. Okay, that's fine. I'm not seeing anything funny. That's okay. Um, um, then, then you do both at once. So what you, all the program does is it takes each pixel in an image, averages it with all neighbors in a 17 by 17 square surrounding it. I can't remember what 17 squared is. 289? Doesn't sound right, does it? That's wrong. Anyway, um, and uh, uh, but with this funny weighting, but that actually turns out to do two things at once: a, average the images with a Gaussian weight; b, take the second derivative. But all you really need to know in terms of parallelization is that you det you, you find the edges by summing. You take for every image pixel, you compute the edge, which is the sum of all the pixels plus or minus eight in each direction of the image at that displacement times some filter. So it's a convolution operation. You're averaging each pixel with all its neighbours with some weight. That gives us an edge, and we, we add that back into the original image with some scaling factor. I think I use a factor of two. And then you have to rescale the image to get it back to 0, 0, 0.255 and all kinds of stuff. But basically, that's what it does. And the most important point is it's clear this is a parallel operation. Well, one, well, one process is, is, is computing uh, one pixel another process can be doing another pixel because they're independent. You're just at your averaging with the neighbors. Um, so you're, um, yeah. So you, you, can, you, can, you can do this, the uh, computation of the edge for any pixel is independent from any other pixel. So I do a completely trivial parallelization. It's all deliberately very, very naive. Uh, a master process reads the image from disk. It broadcasts it to every other processor. So every processor, every core has a complete copy of the image, which is very wasteful, but it's very simple. And then you just scan the line image, the scan the image line by line, and the distribution. If you have to divide the pixels up between processes, if I had four four processes or four cores, uh, each process computes every fourth pixel. So I might do pixels 0, 4, 8, and 12. My neighbor would do pixels 1, 5, 9, and 13. Somebody else. That's a very very simple, naive thing to do. We add them all back together, and then we save to disk. And the important point is the the program reports two times. 
it reports the time for just computing the edges on each processor, which we'd expect to, because it's a, for the computation of each pixel is independent, independent, we'd expect that to scale linearly, the performance to scale linearly, but also the overall time, and the overall time includes I.O., and the I.O. is a serial operation. We just nominate one boss guy to read and write the disk, and we'll see that's sort of the, the fundamental assumption in these parallel performance models that you have a part which is parallelizable and a part which is not, and, and, and you know, the relative weight of the two. So this program was designed to try and model that. So just a diagram. Read the, 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 the picture in on a, di on a particular guy, uh, on a particular process, broadcast it to everybody, and then as I said, if we had four processes, we, we, we'd, we eat processes one, two, three, and four, we would split the image up in that, in that way, scan line by line, and, and, and each take every fourth pixel. And so um, I give you a reference ver serial version and an MPI message passing version um, on the web. And so there's a fairly, um, there's a fairly verbose um, exercise sheet. For this audience, it may be a bit, um, a bit low level. The exercise sheet sort of, sort of assumes that this is probably your first introduction to Linux as well. So some of you will be able to skim through quite a bit of it, but there is the exercise sheet for the sharpen exercise here. I'm oh sorry, that's select the slides. Uh, exercise sheet for sharpen exercise. It's fairly verbose, but hopefully um, it's fairly explicit. It's actually written for Archer, so I have a little crib sheet for those of you who might be using Eddy. Um, just a few things, just a little crib sheet of things you'll need to do differently. Um, the one thing I don't know is um, when you run on, as I said, when you run on a computer resource, you typically have fairly constrained resources. So um, as an informatics user, you will have a budget of time you're allowed to charge your jobs to. And I don't know what that's called. But I know I've told you here to find out what it's called. The default um, job we've given you um, charges to ECDF underscore physics, which is clearly um, relevant to somebody from the, from the School of Physics and Astronomy. So you just need to replace that with your relevant charging code. And, and that's just your Unix group. So if you, do, if you find out what your Unix group is when you're on Eddy, that that will be your charging code, but that's explained in the in the sheet. And um, there's the source code here. It's a compressed tar file um, because um, uh, I distribute the sample images are very raw uh, text format, so I've compressed them because otherwise they're very bloated. But hopefully, I mean, it's up to you. But you know, over the next week, come back next week and talk more about parallel programming models. But both of these examples are very useful. I'll use them as references next week. A, I'll use the traffic model as a, a very simple example of a program which you could think about how it's parallelized in our two programming models, which will turn out to be shared memory and distributed memory. Secondly, the uh, Sharpen example will get you off and running on a parallel machine. But it's also a very useful example to think about simple performance models for parallel programming. Then, actually, in weeks, that's next week, weeks three and four, I'll stop talking about parallel programming so much and talk more about numerical analysis of floating point numbers in week three and then random number PDs and, and particle methods in week four. But the first two weeks are very much focused around parallel computing. And then I'll go on to numerics and a bit about um, various Monte Carlo and particle and PDE based techniques. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, for those remotely, apologies for the audiovisual issues, all the slides are on the web and hopefully by next week, when we do it next week, we'll be able to get you a live um, separate feed. You should have m me flapping my arms about, should be appear as a little icon and the major part of the screen should be taken up as a fairly high res uh, copy of the slides. Um, that, that's the idea. We'll try and get that sorted out for next week.